there is nothing we cannot accomplish. We will make Vermont a free territory. We will govern ourselves intercommunally according to the principles of collectivity and self-determination. People of our age at that time were so thirsty for something new and different. We were just looking for a more connected way to live. We are building a new Many people there thought the revolution was coming tomorrow. We were involved with those kinds of focuses of life, you know. So it was, it was very far out. They wanted to change their own lives and they ended up changing the world. <laughs> it looks the coming towards, the looks positive. just the same. Yeah. 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 Just yeah. the yeah. same. Yeah. Just yeah. the yeah. same. Yeah. 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 Okay. So Does it seem yeah. smaller to you? It's yes. very different. Yeah. Very small. Yeah. Yeah. But it seems smaller to me. Or it's because I'm older. I moved to Mount Philo Collective in the summer of 69. I was 23, I was a single mother, working full time. I didn't fit into conventional society. I was definitely looking for a change and I jumped in with both feet. It was an exhilarating experience. I felt like growth was really possible there and, and um, it was, it, it turned out to be exactly that. I think everybody who's here um, moved in because of personal, some personal feeling like there was no other place to go. Everybody was looking for something that would, would knit their lives together. There are people down there, you know. We were questioning the, the mores of the 50s and early 60s and, and looking for a different way to live. We came together as people interested in an experimental lifestyle, but at Mount Philo, we weren't as committed and intentional as some of the other Back to the Land communes were. The Back to the Land movement refers to a big demographic shift that happened starting in the late 1960s. Hundreds of thousands, possibly a million young people from the city, white, well-educated, middle class, activist-minded, environmentally-minded, interested in self-sufficiency, left urban areas and moved to rural areas all across the country. And Vermont is one of the places where the impact of that demographic movement was the highest. People who arrived in Vermont in the late 60s and early 70s were really worried about, uh, it sort of sounds a little bit strange to us now maybe, but they were really worried about system collapse. <laughs> At that particular time, an overarching concern was the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War. The war in Vietnam. It was against the war. I hear some of the young people here say, stop the war. And we were thinking, what in the world is going on over there? Certainly the assassination of Martin Luther King. Wounded knee. The civil rights. Those were such drastic times. So clearly we wanted to and militarism in the United States. Back to the landers and, and um, people living in communes, many of them were activists. The Vietnam War protests had turned violent and that it had become actually dangerous to be um, involved in street protests in the cities. And so moving to Vermont and saying like, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna yell in the street, I'm not gonna protest in the street, I'm actually just gonna change my whole life and live out every single day this sort of like protest to the system. A couple of other things were important, bringing people in the counterculture to Vermont. Land was available and it was one of the places where people could find farmland in the Northeast. I came to Vermont in 1970 and we were transplants from California and we started looking for land in northern Vermont and found a place in Franklin. When we moved on to it there were probably ten people, five couples. I came to Vermont in 1969 with my husband and my two children. I was 26 years old. I say often that I was sort of an accidental hippie because before that I had been a housewife basically in Madison, Wisconsin. I got married early and we were very enthralled with the whole concept of being an extended family together. We thought we were doing this for the rest of our lives. We were making a commitment. We were going to communalize all of our money, all of our possessions, all of our children, everything. And we were going to embark on living on a farm off the grid. Counting communes is a very difficult job. The best numbers that people can find probably around 50 in 1970, and then at least one scholar counted 200 all around the state just a few years later. There was a fear in the summer of 
1970 that 50,000 people were going to arrive into Vermont. There was a fear of the hippie influx. It felt so real to Vermonters, both in the counterculture and locals, that Governor Dean Davis felt the need to issue a press release saying that, you know, even if 50,000 hippies were going to arrive all of a sudden in Vermont, we, you know, that the state of Vermont was committed to making sure that they followed the law, but it was a real fear that that was going to happen. It was a huge movement in Vermont. If I look at it from the point of view of the people who lived here before, it could really feel like an invasion of strangers. But some of the old timers loved us. We work with horses. There was a person that loved horses and helped us learn that skill. There were people that loved to sugar and they helped us learn to sugar. So we had real, real wonderful connections in the town. We were a collective too. We weren't a commune because those were hippies and drug. You know, no, nah, man. We were no. We were serious. We were the political collective, okay. not the commune, hippie commune. Most people's conceptions of communes, people think of communes as hippies, but I can't really say that I had spent much time with, with hippies. Most of the people that I knew with the communes were, were political activists. Little did we know, of course, the FBI had people visiting us in undercover, coming back from uh, May Day demonstrations. I, the bus would stop by Howard Johnson's turnaround down in Brattleboro. I got out and there was FBI. Welcome me home and they say, you want to ride? <laughs> and they drove me home. We were tight with the Panthers and the Weather Underground. And that was the real reason for all of the FBI uh, raids. <laughs> so much so that Weather said, don't go to Vermont. They're just looking for you there. The FBI did come here, but we were not afraid of them. Our phones were tapped. We had FBI agents and undercover people in our houses, in our meetings. I think we all had FBI files on us. 300 pages, probably, of uh, Douglas seen in Madrid, Spain at a major demonstration. I was never there. Anything revolutionary, that's what they were looking for. Student activists, the political activists, the revolutionaries, the people who lived on communes, people who were active in the women's liberation movement, the Black Panthers, the White Panthers. I mean, it was on and on and on. It was extraordinary the degree to which we were uh, looked after a lot, yeah. Call up your man and look at what you see. Put your hands to the future. Free. The anti-war movement at the time included an underground railroad and in that we were so close to the Canadian border, Franklin even closer, we became part of it. I took a young man who had exhausted all of his options to Canada and it was a, I don't remember this as being momentous but it, it now looking back it certainly was. We drove him across the border into Canada, let him out, and he went on hitchhiking. And then we came back through another border crossing. So that's how that worked. Also, we helped people develop other um, identities who wanted to uh, stay in this country. We went to town halls, city halls, to find birth certificates of people who were no longer alive basically, who died when they were babies or infants, and using those uh, identities for uh, people to um, take on. There was so much happening then. It's hard out of context to, I think, to appreciate the changes that were going on then. The sexual revolution, the peace movement. There was a whole health care movement. In the women's movement, you could not live on a, on a commune collective without being a part of that. The women's movement contributed mightily to the establishment of free clinics around the country. We started with a group of people from various communes, but also political activists in the Burlington area. We started the free clinic, and we got doctors to donate their time, and so we would have two or three nights a week that we had free care. 
We were convinced that we could change the way healthcare was delivered, at least in the old north end of Burlington. And it survives today as a community health center and certainly is an institution. And that all started from our idea of making healthcare right in the beginning. My first intersection with communes was really around the issue of reproductive rights for women. In 1972, that was a time when abortion was illegal everywhere that I know of in the United States. In Vermont at the time, the legal situation was that women could get abortions, but doctors couldn't perform them, which led to the situation of unsafe abortions everywhere. The Vermont Supreme Court said that the law was too contradictory and that it had to be stricken from the books. So there was a period of time that the prohibition against doctors doing abortions was kind of overturned and there was a vacuum produced. It wasn't illegal then in Vermont. So between like four or five months, we quickly got it together with money and a doctor to form what was called the Vermont Women's Health Center, which was opened prior to Roe v. Wade. And that Women's Health Center was, as far as I knew, the first clinic in the United States that performed abortions. Want a tomato? Here. Thank you. And the other thing was food. Mm. You know, we really wanted good food and access to good food. And so we started by doing these buying groups. And you would put together your order and people would put them together at the farmers markets and you know wholesale places and bring them up and distribute them to the communes. And ultimately the buying groups became the Onion River Co-op but is now uh, incarnated as City Market. I can't believe that the whole thing you know lasted about two and a half years for, for me anyway at Franklin. It just seemed like a lifetime. We didn't know anything. We just thought we could just do it, which we did. It was amazing that way. However, the group living, commune living, collective living, whatever you call it, is extremely taxing. With the draft uh, ending in 72 and the war winding down, I think there was a lot of the impetus wasn't there anymore, but I think most of us stayed very true to our roots as far as um, the roots that we established once we lived communally. I believe that the communes brought incredible change in values uh, in Vermont. We were very well aware that it was a small state and that we had a very good chance of influencing life in Vermont. And that was, I think, one of the reasons that drew a lot of people here in the commune movement. People who lived on the commune came into the cities and helped build politics. And I became more community oriented, I became an organizer, and I would say that that organizing part of me um, was noticed by Bernie. And Bernie asked me if I would run for the city council. So he helped me. I won by 10 votes, same as he had. A lot of the people that I knew that were part of that movement, mostly the women stayed. And um, yeah. uh, I think sure. we have them to thank for the kind of culture that we have here in the state of Vermont. Welcome to Total Loss Farm. Famous, formless, flaky together, greet you with open arms. Screen door smashes into the weather, set down your roots and roam. There's no place like home. I'm the one who stayed because of the magnetism of this place. I feel that there's something generous and compelling about this particular piece of land. This Oops. is where the clothesline was. Yep. Yeah. This is where we do, and, 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 and I remember that acutely because we must have spent a ton of time here. Yeah. The line was full of diapers all the time. Yeah. I'm sentimentally attached to what happened here and what happened to me here. That was my first room. Yeah. 
What happened, I think, to everyone who lived here, what we went through and how we learned and how we grew and how we grew to care for each other. And All these, these commune arts will always be my family. I always know that they have my back and that I have their back. Many people brought their desire to change and to change the world into this state which has absorbed those people, and those people, many of whom are of amazing stature in this state, came out of that Back to the Land movement of the 60s and 70s. For that pinkish haze across the orchard, 10,000 blossoms on a widow's peak, we forsook the revolution and bought the farm. It was a different world. It was a different world. And I think what's really surprising is how long we go without talking about it. I still want to change the world, I really do. The people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. More appropriate now than right. ever. Oh, so cool. Production funding for Beyond Bernie was provided in part by Three Hats Bookkeeping. Do you want to spend less time bookkeeping? Meet Three Hats Bookkeeping. We pair you with a dedicated bookkeeping team. Each month, your team categorizes your transactions into accurate financial statements. Bookkeeping done for you.